My name is Ali. I'm a doctor and YouTuber. I'm Taymor. I'm a data scientist and writer. And you're listening to Not Overthinking, the weekly podcast where we think about happiness, creativity, and the human condition. Hey, Tay. How's it going? Hey, man. I'm all right. How are you? I haven't really spoken to you this week. Yeah, man. I'm great. I'm enjoying life. Life at work. I've started my surgery placement, which has been quite tough because I have to wake up at half six in the morning every day. But apart from that... Tough times, mate. Yeah, man. What can you do? All right. This week, let's talk about a theory of mine, Mm. if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. What's the theory? Uh, The theory is called measure. Uh, I'm going to go into explaining what it is. Yeah, but uh, as an M E A S U R E. Yeah, yeah, like measuring tape or something. You know. Okay, cool. Uh, So now we we know how to refer to it. So I'm just going to put the name out there. It's it's a theory called measure. Sweet. All right, I'm going to start off by telling you a story that happened not too long ago in our house. So we recently moved into a new flat, as you know, in St Albans. Uh, My mum and I live here, and we started sort of decking out the place, getting furniture and things like that. And so one of the decisions that we had to make was what kind of bin to get for the kitchen. What kind right? of bin to get for a the ki- kitchen? A kitchen bin, yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. You've got a bin in, in your flat, right? You, uh, you you quite like it. I quite like it, but like for ages we didn't have a bin in the flat and right. one, and my housemate Molly was, was full on campaigning to get a decent bin in the oh, flat. nice. And I was thinking, you know, how can we possibly spend money on a bin? <laughs> ah. And she said that actually uh, at her sister's house, they had this bin that you wave your hand over it and it, you know, the lid pops up automatically and then it closes automatically. Oh, yeah. yeah. And genuinely, since buying this bin for her as a Christmas present, I think it's the single most most kind of quality of life improving purchase that oh, wow. I've almost ever bought in my life. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm sure you agree with, with me on this story. Uh, so we had to decide what bin to get. My mom was of the school of thought that, you know, it's just a bin. Like, it's not going to make your day. It's not going to be super exciting. It just has to do the job. And she, she wanted to get like a pretty average kind of standard bin for the kitchen. Um, now, I thought that actually we should, a kitchen bin is something worth investing in. Uh, it's something that we should really just go all out and get a top of the line bin. So I was campaigning to get a particular bin called the Simple Human Butterfly Slimline 30 Liter Bin. Really, really nice bin. Um, my mom didn't really get it at all. And even to me, it seemed counterintuitive. Like 120 pounds on a bin. That seemed insane. I'd never really bought a kitchen bin before. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, it did seem kind of bonkers. Now, the reason I thought it was still worth it um, was because I think a bin is a high measure item, right? And by that, I mean that it, it never gives you any massive amount of value each time you use it. Like you're never gonna tell your friends, oh man, had a, had a great interaction with the bin today. Um, but the fact that you use it so much, you know, you probably use your kitchen bin five or 10 times a day. Um, and you probably you, you probably keep the same kitchen bin pretty much while you're in an inner house, right? Like you might use it for a decade. You're using this thing five to 10 times a day for a decade. Um, and so even though each time you use it, it doesn't really make your day. It's not, not particularly exciting. The fact that you use it so often and over such a long period of time means that even if your bin experience was like slightly better, 20% better, even if, even if it was just better, that that would add up a, to a lot of extra value in your life over the sort of five, five to 10 times a day over 10 years, if that makes sense. Okay, so what you're saying is it's reasonable to buy a 120 pound bin because even if it's, let's say a 1% improvement, the fact that you're using it 10 times a day for 365 days a year for 10 years of your life means that that is worth whatever, pretty much whatever money you spend on it. Yeah, pretty much. So I, th- I think... Okay, so why is this theory particularly groundbreaking? Like, why why, why do you have to give this a name of measure? Ah, uh, good question, good question. Am I just being pretentious again? Uh, I don't think I am. I So I think you can sort of think about your life in terms of moments in time that give you a certain amount of value, right? And then your sort of, your objective on this planet is to try and maximize like the total value you're getting out of all of your life. So like the total value of all of these events in your life. Okay, so like the area under the curve almost. Yeah, yeah. If you've done like GCSE math or something, it's kind of like taking an integral or whatever, but you, you don't need to think of it that way. Um, and so, so some events might, it, it, events contribute value in different ways, right? Some events might have like a really high burst of value that lasts over a very short period of time. I think like going out for a nice meal is something like that. You know, maybe you're eating this food for like an hour or something. It's really, really nice while you're having it. But after the meal is done, that food isn't really providing you much value. So it's like this this burst of high value that goes away quite quickly. Now, other things are, are less exciting. Like th- there's no burst of value, but it kind of sort of drips a small amount of value over a very long period of time, right? Um, and what I think is that when, we, when we're evaluating different decisions, when we're thinking about, oh, how best should I spend my time or how best should I spend my money, we actually have a bias towards 
thinking about sort of these bursts of value events, you know, these events that have a high magnitude of value, but don't last very long. Um, so you might think of like going, going to holiday to a really nice place. Oh yeah, I should spend loads of money on a holiday. It'll be like loads of fun. Cause you're thinking about like the, the magnitude of the value you're getting out of it at some point in time. Um, but I think, I think this is actually really misleading. And the things that add up to a lot more value over time are these things that aren't particularly exciting, but they just provide a small amount of value over a very long period of time and very often. And so I think a bin is an example of this, where you use it a lot, you use it for a very long time. And so it's worth having a nice experience every time you do it. Other things, for example, are like, say a backpack, right? Um, I first got a serious backpack, maybe like three or four years ago. It was like a birthday present to myself. I spent like I think like 60 pounds on a backpack. This was in the summer after my second year or something. 60 pounds at the time was a lot of money for me to be spending on a backpack. But my thinking was that like, you know, I use a backpack every day. You know, I carry my books in it. I carry my laptop in it, whatever. I use this thing every day for a few hours and uh, I'll essentially not replace it until it breaks. And so if I get a good backpack, you know, if the 60 pound backpack was just, you know, 20% better than a 20 pound backpack, it would still be worth it because I use it so often um, that this extra 20% adds up to a lot of extra value over the course of my life. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think I'm fully on board with this measure theory mm. of yours. Um, I've always been an advocate for spending money in the areas in which you're spending your time. So this was a piece of financial advice that I came across like ages ago that was that uh, you should always invest good money in a pair of shoes and you should always invest good money in a bed because you're spending eight uh, hours a day with your pair of shoes and in your bed. Yeah, exactly. So that seems, you know, that that is a nod to your measure theory, just not called exactly that. Yeah, that's right. I think one one domain in which I struggle with reconciling measure theory with other other sort of heuristics of decision making as yeah, such sure. is this idea of diminishing returns. So as you said, 20 pound bag versus 60 pound bag, it's not going to be, you know, your 60 pound bag is not three times as good as your 20 pound bag. It's only, let's say 10% or 20% better. Equally, you know, when I evaluate technology on my, on my YouTube channel or whatever, you know, a 1300 pound iPad pro is not twice as good and definitely not four times as good as a 319 pounds regular run of the mill iPad. But, you know, how do we, how do we justify that four times increase in price? One way of doing it, as you said, is, you know, in, in, in terms of in terms of measure theory that I use my iPad so often that even a 10% improvement is is worth it. Right. But I wonder to what extent that's true. So, for example, with my car, my car, let's say it costs six grand uh, to buy second hand. I could, at a stretch, buy a Tesla if I really wanted to. And let's say I were commuting two hours a day back and forth from work, which I will be doing next year. Yeah. You probably still wouldn't advocate me buying a Tesla for forty thousand pounds relative to my car of six thousand pounds. So, like, how 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 does this this how 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 does this calculation fit into your measure theory? Uh, just to point out, that was a nice bit of wealth signaling there. Oh yeah, I could uh, I could probably buy a Tesla if I wanted to. Just uh, just want to put it out there. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say I could buy a Tesla with a change in my wallet right now, but I thought, <laughs> I, I thought that would be a little bit excessive, <gasps> that possibly would... alienate a few members of the audience. That's all. That's all that YouTube money, isn't it? <laughs> all, all all of that, I mean, all those brand deals, and uh, you know, I, su I suppose that people are right when they say it's just these two rich boys chatting. <laughs> yeah, you're always saying things like, "Oh yeah, I could buy a Tesla." Anyway, um, yeah, so I th I think that's that's maybe where this series sort of starts to break down. Um, the, the question is like for you, how much extra value might that Tesla provide, right? Uh, if you're driving like eight hours a day or something, uh, which you, you won't be, you're driving like a couple of hours every day, right? Mm. Um, I, I don't think a Tesla would actually provide that much extra value, right? It, it might only be sort of a couple of percent better than, than like a car, Nissan right? Note or something. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, and then another, th so I think there's definitely diminishing returns there, I think maybe in in the Tesla example, it it does seem like the extra value you get out of it is extremely low. So I probably wouldn't go for the Tesla in that scenario. But I think there are things where there are diminishing returns, but the thing is so high measure that it's worth investing in, right? Uh, for example, I think I think maybe glasses is something like this. I think glasses are sort of underinvested in by most people. Uh, I mean, I wear glasses, you wear glasses. Um, it's pretty much the way we see, right? Mm. Um, in the grand scheme of things, the glasses are like extremely valuable to us in terms of what we get out of them. Uh, but they're, they're, they're pretty cheap for what they do, right? They're like, I don't know, you can get glasses for like 50 quid or something, right? Yeah, sure. Um, but 
one thing, for example, is that you could sort of spend more money on glasses by getting better lenses, right? You can get lenses that are like anti-reflective. Or, oh, with like, or, you know, anti-blue light and yeah, helps you sleep like better that. at night and all that crap. And yeah. so I think something like seeing is such a high measure thing. Like you're doing it every moment you're awake. It's, <laughs> it's, so, it's so high measure that you, you know, if you can afford it, it really does make sense to go all out on whatever lenses there are, right? Like if, if Leica made lenses for glasses, <laughs> I'd, I'd buy a bloody Leica lens for my glasses because glasses are just so high measure, right? It's hard to argue with, with investing in something like eyesight. Yes, but then again, the idea of diminishing returns comes in because let's say you could get a pair of Specsavers glasses for 30 or 40 pounds. Yeah. Would you really notice the difference between that and, you know, let's say the glasses I'm wearing at the moment, Giorgio Armani frames that were £425 when I first bought them. Yeah, in fairness, I've been using these exact same glasses for the last five years and I get cheap lenses made from Pakistan. But even then, I still get the, all the anti-reflective, anti-scratch, anti-blue light coatings on them. Is there really any any difference, any tangible difference between that and a £30 pair of, pair of glasses from Specsavers? I'd argue uh-huh. probably not. I actually, I, I don't think the issue here is diminishing returns because like, yes, there are diminishing returns. I think the measure does sort of cancel it out. The mm-hmm. fact that the returns are diminished, but they're still multiplied by such a long uh, sort of period of time. I think the issue here is sort of this idea of the hedonic treadmill, right? The idea that we sort of get used to whatever luxuries we sort of get and we stop getting extra value out of them. Um, I don't think that's quite the issue I'm referring to. I don't, I don't think I will hedonically adapt to my... Because when it comes to something like glasses... Yeah. Um, You'd want to think that a better lens that, you know, your Leica 800 pound glasses lenses are providing a distinct value as opposed to just the fact that you feel good about them. Okay. Hit on a hit on, hit on treadmill refers to how you feel about that particular purchase. And sure, yeah, I mean, I could be wearing a pair of 10 pound Specsavers glasses and I wouldn't feel any different about them. But surely my 500 pound pair of glasses, surely with those expensive lenses is providing some actual value. And I'd... I'd, I'd hazard a guess that when it comes to glasses, that's maybe maybe not the case. Although, now that you mentioned that, I think there is something else that, that needs to come into this equation. And that is the idea of how much disposable income do you really have? Like, if we were both bajillionaires, we'd probably feel differently about the Tesla situation. We'd be like, yeah. you, know what, you, you know what? I'm in a car for two hours a day. That's such a high measure item. <laughs> I should spend... Eighty thousand dollars on a Tesla, and that yeah, it's just so high measure. You, you know, it's 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 one twelfth of your whole life. Whereas we we don't quite have the luxury to be able to afford a Tesla just like that. Therefore, we regard it as 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 more of so something we have to think about. Yeah, Whereas yeah, yeah. you and I are privileged enough that spending one hundred twenty pounds on a bin is you know it's not going to change your life in the slightest. It's not it's not going to make a dent in your back balance essentially. Right. Whereas for someone else, the idea of spending one hundred twenty pounds in a bin. Let's say if you took us six years ago when we were just finishing school, spending one hundred twenty pounds in a bin would have been completely and utterly absurd. That would have felt and, bonkers. And even the measure theory would have, would have not convinced either of us that actually I should be spending one hundred and twenty pounds on a bin. You you make a good point there. Yeah, I think obviously you do sort of have to rescale everything and adjust for sort of. How, how, many re, how, how many resources you have, how much time you have, or how much money you have, right? Um, so maybe, maybe this measure theory doesn't really help too much in making those kinds of decisions. I feel like it does a bit, because like the bin thing, for example, it, wa- it was counterintuitive. Like we could afford the bin, but it was still counterintuitive. It still felt weird and it still felt wrong. And I think it was the right thing to do to think about it in terms of measure, think that it's yeah, really I agree. I I think, so I think it is helpful there. Okay, so However, uh, uh, so I think what you're what you're saying is that the measure theory is good as a way of counteracting our pre-existing bias towards valuing magnitude rather than considering measure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and given that we know we have that bias, we can call to to the for to the forefront of our mind measure theory as a mental model, which you love to yes. go on about all the time. Yeah, um, and that does help make better decisions. Obviously, there are other factors that go into it, like how much disposable income you have, or how much actual practical value you get out of your new pair of glasses. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, the point is, once you have the vocabulary to describe a particular thought process, a mental model as such, then you can apply it where it works and choose not to apply it where it doesn't. Yeah, I think I think the vocabulary point is actually pretty good. Um, so in my sort of day job, I work for a tech startup. Uh, we often have to sort of prioritize what we work on, like what new features, for example, to add to our app, say. Um, and often it comes down to like trying to figure out, okay, how valuable is this feature actually going to be for our users? Um, and often like there'll be some like big sexy feature that, w- that might make like a splash and, and get lots of attention. And that would be like a high magnitude feature that, that might not necessarily be 
high measure. Um, and on the other hand, there are features where we're just making like a small tweak that very slightly improves some part of the experience. But this part of the experience might be something that all the users face, you know, for a long time while they use the app. And so having having this vocabulary of like distinguishing between uh, things that are high magnitude and things that are high measure, we, we have actually found it useful. And often in these discussions, we might say, okay, yeah, let's work on this particular thing. It's really high measure, so we should work on it. Um, so I think that's nice. Um, however, I think the real value here um, yes, this might help you make better financial decisions, better decisions on how to spend your time. But I think there's probably a ton of things that we overlook in our lives. Um, I think I think we overlook a lot of things just because it's kind of unconventional. Um, so if, if we sort of think about the high measure aspects of our lives and whether we're investing in them, I think it could lead to like new new ways we can improve our lives and get more value out of things. I think one thing, for example, is, you know, you often hear about oh, people in the music industry, actors and actresses and singers and stuff, they all have like voice coaches, right? They have voice coaches to help them control and understand their own voice. Um, and that's great. Like they're getting paid to use their voice. They're getting paid to sing and act. So it makes sense for them to be investing in this way. However, the rest of us, I mean, we use our voices all the time, right? No. Much of our waking hours, all our interactions with people are using our voice. Um, so our voices are like a very high measure thing. Hmm. You wouldn't normally think of it as something to invest in, like something to spend time thinking about, something to spend money training. Um, but if you could sort of spend some resources to better understand your voice or improve your voice by like 10 or 20%, the fact that it's such a high measure thing surely means more people should be doing it. Okay, and yeah, and how many people are thinking, how many normal people who aren't in the business of show, aren't in show business, are thinking... <laughs> Uh, look, I'd start the sentence. I had to, I had to say that awkward <laughs> phrase. Not in the business of show. <laughs> <laughs> Someone needs to improve their voice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like I, I think we, we, most people don't think. Oh yeah, I should like invest in my voice. Uh, so, so I think that's a, an example of like something that's really high measure that we just don't think about because I, it, it's not really conventional, right? Okay. Yeah, I fully buy that. We don't have the vocabulary to describe things like that. Therefore, we just don't think about it. Yeah. I, I've never once thought about you know, improving my voice in that sense. But you're right, it is... That's it's, not true. You had his, singing lessons. As, oh, oh, yeah, in terms of singing, but not in terms of speaking. Oh, sure. But I mean, I mean I'm, guess, I'm guessing it's a lot of the same thing. Uh, through your singing lessons, you must have, like, gotten a better understanding of your voice, different parts of your voice, different sort of... <sighs> yeah, I guess. Things like that. But I feel like it's not... Uh, having having singing lessons hasn't really changed the way that my okay. voice sounds. Yeah, may, maybe but singing is like a... I think singing, yeah. Than kettle of fish. Um, so I, yeah, I think there's, there's probably a lot more of these sort of high measure things that we, we just don't think about, we don't, we don't think about thinking about them and we don't think about investing in them mm. because partly because no one else is really doing it. And that's sort of, that's a big driver of the things that we do end up thinking about. And partly I think because we sort of lack the language to express that certain things are valuable, even though they're not particularly showy or exciting. So I think voice is one of them. I think like speaking is one of them as well so like th this is something that more people are sort of onto than the voice thing like a lot of people have public speaking lessons um you know and if you're if you're any kind of person who interacts with other people speaking is a massive part of what you do if you have a job where you're working with other people you know being able to speak better being able to communicate better in meetings and things that's a hugely valuable thing um and even just like so socially you know you're speaking all the time if you can get better at speaking um, that will surely pay dividends over your lifetime. And so we should, more people should probably be thinking about taking public speaking lessons or having, having a coach to help them learn how to communicate, right? Yeah, yeah, that sounds, that sounds very reasonable. <laughs> I think that the tragedy in all of this is that the people who do end up investing in this stuff are the people who will somehow end up making money from it. So all these business executives and stuff, they have coaches for all sorts of things, all of these things. They're sort of directly making money out of this thing. And so they directly invest in it. Um, and it's 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 kind of unfair that like the rest of us are doing these things all the time. We don't really think about investing in them because we're not really getting direct money out of it. Like mm. it's it's hard to estimate the value money what monetarily of these things. Yeah. But if we just think about the measure of it, it's almost a no-brainer that like, yeah, I, I should actually tomorrow Google for a voice coach, right? Yeah, like, mate, that's what I'm going to really do tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do it tonight, not even tomorrow. <laughs> so like, what what are these other things where, yeah, I, yeah this, I think this is actually the crux of the issue. It's hard for us to like value things. I think capitalism kind of leads to s some people valuing some things. Um, <laughs> that's <I'm>, right. <laughs> 
as you said, I think capitalism leads to some people valuing some things. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Uh, as you could tell, I'm a, a, a deep thinking economist. Um, but no, yeah, I, I feel like I feel like there's something here, right? I like, feel like there's something. It, here, it's definitely. it's kind of unfair that the people who end up investing in these things are people who are directly making money off of these things, e.g., business executives, whatever, or and then, actors and actresses and their voices. And then, and then, almost in a way, it becomes a, a reason for normal people to not invest in those things. Like if I were yeah. if I were thinking about taking voice lessons, my initial excuse for that would be, oh, but. I'm not making money through my voice. Like, yeah. you know, it, this worry if I'm, I'm not Jeff Bezos. <laughs> yeah. That was a throwback to episode one where we had a, a bit of a back and forth about Jeff Bezos. He, did we? I think we did. He makes money through his voice? Uh, he, he's a business executive kind of thing, right? Oh, okay. okay oh, yeah, right. Yeah. I was trying to find some deeper meaning to your Jeff Bezos. Sorry, I was thinking, no, like, very... what news items recently have just, apart from the scandal with his uh, pictures? Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, how do we get onto this? Impro- all right, and so, so, so improving the voice. Yes. Um, my excuse would have been that, oh, well, I don't make money from it. I mean, like, it's it's not something that will directly impact my life. Therefore, why should I put money into it? Yeah. Um, and you're saying that just that purely on the basis that it's a high measure thing. Yeah. You should be investing on it, even if you're not going to make any direct money out of it. Yeah. It'll just, by default, pay dividends over your yeah, life. Yeah, it's such a far reaching thing in every aspect of your life that you should definitely be investing in it. Whether that's Whether that's just like, reading up on it and trying to improve yourself or whether that's getting a coach or going to lessons or whatever, it's something worth investing in. And I think the rest of us don't really see that because we're not getting tangible money money out of it. And uh, some people who are getting tangible money out of it, they do see that. Okay, yeah, I can buy that. So what, what might other things be that are like really high measure that normal people won't even be thinking, you know, normal people like us won't even be thinking about because it doesn't feel like we're directly getting value out of them, but they're actually hugely oh, valuable. So that reminds me... Um- Prior to this conversation and the previous conversations we've had about this, I didn't have this vocabulary of measure to describe right. stuff. So, for example, when I was trying to tell people, like, recommend books about stoicism, about philosophy to people, I'd I'd find it really hard to sell this as why why this is valuable. People would be like, oh, why do I care about this? Whatever. And, 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 and I'd be thinking in my head that, sh- like, surely it's a no-brainer. The way you feel about events and you know, how they dictate your personal happiness and whether they make you feel angry or sad or whatever, being able to control your emotions like that and just be- becoming happier in in general day-to-day life, it just has so many far-reaching consequences for through your, throughout your entire life that's, that surely it is a no-brainer to actively invest in reading about, thinking about things like philosophy and w- these mental models, these ways of thinking that make us happier people. Yeah. Um, but now I have this me- this idea of measure that yeah. you know pretty much anything that happens you're going to respond to it in some way or another. It's it's as you say a no brainer to work out how to do this. Yeah, more, yeah, more stuff optimally. like your 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 mindset and and the way you frame things in life. This is this like affects your well being at, at all points in time, right? Um, and so if if you can somehow get better at that, mm. then you're going to get a m- massive extra value out of your life. Okay. The, the same thing goes for things like mental health. I think people are starting to get more aware of it now and more people are starting to think sort of very consciously about their mental health, Um, especially sort of in the tech industry now. uh, There's much less of a taboo against sort of having a therapist and stuff. Um, And so lots of people are getting therapists and it's quite an open thing now, whereas maybe a couple of decades ago, if you were open about, oh, I have a therapist, that might have been an extremely weird thing to do and people might have sort of looked down upon you for it. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I wouldn't even think of getting a therapist unless I had some sort of quote mental health issue. Right, exactly. But but even if I don't, it's 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 a no brainer that you, that you should just get a therapist because yes, it's because it's like a super high measure thing. Yeah, because even even if you can, you can improve your mental health by two percent, even if you don't have a, you know if you don't have a diagnosis of anxiety or depression or something, yeah, that two percent is is going to be hundred percent worth it over the long. Yeah, exactly. Long term. I, like physical health is another another no brainer. That's something that's like fairly well accepted in society. But I, I imagine there was probably a time, you know, in like the Victorian era, where it's like cool to be fat and stuff because it me- means you're like wealthy. Yeah, I'm sure there like, were some people <laughs> who were like, oh yeah, I want to like lift this rock up and down a lot. You know, <laughs> I just I just feel it's going to add a lot of value to my life. <laughs> it's such a high measure item. This yeah, they probably, they probably weren't saying it was high measure. Yeah. <laughs> they, I'm sure there were some people who were like really into weird things like lifting things up and down. Maybe... I'm sure there was a time when it was like weird to be into like cardiovascular fitness, like going for runs and things. Mm. I'm sure that there was a time in, in, in all societies where this was unconventional and the people who were investing in their physical health 
will probably seem to be quite weird. Why is this dude running laps? He's not getting anywhere. <laughs> what an idiot, you know? <laughs> He's literally going in circles. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now it's a more accepted thing. And so everyone, everyone's fairly normal about like investing in physical health. It's like a high measure thing. It's very valuable. Ah, oh, so earlier this year, actually, um, I was deciding what sort of workouts to do this year. Cause I was like, you know, before work, I want to go to the gym. I want to do this and that. And I realized that actually the thing I need to focus on this year is my posture. Oh. And if there's only one thing that I focus on this yeah. entire year, it's going to be my posture. I'm going to do my face pulls. I'm going to do the stretches. going to get rid of my anterior pelvic tilt. going to get rid of my nerd neck thing. Yeah. Because who cares if I have slightly bigger pecs? What matters is that, you know, my the, the posture thing just is so high measure. It's crazy. Yeah. I just never had the vocabulary to describe that. Yeah, I, I think po posture is a crazy one because every year I reach the conclusion, man, I have really bad posture. It, th this is starting to become a serious issue in my life. I have almost constant back pains. I think my spine is deformed, malformed. Uh, I definitely have anterior pelvic tilt. And I often, yeah, I often reach the conclusion, oh man, I should probably do something about this. Um, but sort of labeling it as like a very high measure thing to do, I think it does help. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it especially helps if you've started started going on about this measure stuff on your blog and your podcast and stuff. And then you're not actually uh, sort of taking your own medicine. and oh, quite. It, yeah. Investing in the high measure things. Investing in the high measure things yourselves. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think posture is definitely one of them. Physical health, mental health, voice. There's got to be There's got to be more. <laughs> it's, it's, so it's, it's hard to think of them because they're so invisible, right? Yeah. Like what, what other things are there in like our sort of day-to-day -day life? Ah, I think relationships is one of them for sure. Um, I think one, so for example, I live with my mum. We spend like a decent amount of time every day, I think, at least a few hours. Um, and I guess I've, I've lived at home on and off for the, since I graduated uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and so my, I guess my relationship with my mum is quite a high measure thing. And to be honest, I don't think my relationship with my mom has changed an awful lot in the past year and a half. And that that's kind of a shame because it would be nice if it's sort of improved in some way, like we'd both get more value out of this thing, right? Yeah. So that's quite a high measure thing. I haven't really thought too consciously about it, but when I think about it, like I should I should definitely be consciously trying to improve that relationship because it is quite a high measure thing. We'll both get a lot of value out of it over time, you know? Okay, so this makes me think about two points. The first one is, I feel like a lot of this high measure stuff would come under the stamp of self-help. And then people like you who are pretentious would think, oh God, this is self-help advice. I'm not going to take it. I'm, 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 I'm going to ignore that bit of, of the thing because hmm. earlier today, uh, like in, in, the, in this conversation, you were saying something like, oh, you know, your mindsets and the way you think about the world and your mental health, you know, that's, that's really important. And that is exactly the sort of thing that you'd find in a self-help section of a bookshop. And yet you rail against self, like self-help as a concept. Okay, okay. Do you realize that essentially what you're advocating for is self-help? <laughs> uh, sort of. Okay, I think, I think we've sort of run into a limitation of language here, right? I think self-help is a very multidimensional thing. Hmm. And there are, there are dimensions of, uh, dimensions of self-help that I don't like. Um, I, I, I just think, or at least my experience with self-help was that maybe when I was around 15 or 16, I discovered the self-help industry. Like I, I started finding out, oh man, all these people who are like older than me and more experienced, they've like written about how to do life better. You know, this is incredible. I'd like, I spent hours and hours reading this for weeks and weeks. Yeah. I thought this was going to change my life. Yeah. Um, and so I'd read all these articles about like productivity and life advice and careers and all this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, and ultimately I didn't really get that much value out of it. I, because I think there's, yeah, like I said, there's different dimensions of self-help. There's there's dimensions along which advice isn't really the bottleneck. For example, someone can tell me to go to the gym every day. Just, yeah. just like go to the gym, man. Yeah, I know that, you know, obviously. Um, and, and the same with, I think it's the same with a lot of this like productivity stuff. So I, I think the self-help I don't like is this sort of the life hack kind of approach, uh, which I think is quite prevalent in, yeah, I guess in the productivity sphere and things like that. Whereas for me, the challenge has always been my own personal discipline. And I haven't really found any advice that can actually help me with that. I think that's just like an internal journey. So that, that's my beef with self-help. I don't have any beef with people trying to improve themselves. I think that's really important. I just have beef with like certain slices of self-help where, yeah, it's I think it's certain slices of it are dangerous because it feels valuable and it feels useful. Like you're spending time reading these things. Like, oh, whoa, I know all this stuff now. And it's actually not that valuable at the end of the day. So I, I feel like I've sunk a lot of time into self-help that I didn't get much value out of. Okay, right. Um, 
I have issue with this, the, this, this thing that you're saying, because what you're saying is that the advice is out there, but you are not very good at implementing the advice. Me personally, yes. Yeah, therefore you're saying that you have beef with the advice. This does not sound legit. This sounds like me buying a cookbook and saying, oh, well, I can't be bothered to cook. Therefore, cookbooks are a waste of time. I mean, and f- fair enough. For me, getting a cookbook might therefore be a waste of time. But to, for, for, for me to rail against the industry of cookbooks, because I personally don't know how to use a kitchen, is completely <laughs> unacceptable. And sure, you might say that productivity advice hasn't worked for you. I think it's worked absolutely wonders for me. These, these you know, books that you would find in the self-help section of the library or in the entrepreneurship section, which is probably another section you would rail against, <laughs> those have completely changed my life and allowed me to build my brand, my passive income, my whatever. Um, because I think I'm pretty good at implementing the advice that they offer. When Tim Ferriss tells me to do something in his book or in his podcast 100, 100, 100, 125 different times, I'll probably do it, except meditation, which I haven't managed to do yet. <laughs> but that's a high measure thing that I need, to, I, need, I need to start work on. And it's unfair for you to rail against self-help because you personally don't know how to follow it. Just like it would be unfair for me to rail against the strong lifts weightlifting program because I personally am unable to follow it because I'm not disciplined enough. Um, I think that's a fair point. I feel I feel a bit personally attacked right now. Okay, let's move on. We can talk about self-help another time. The second thing I, w- I was going to talk about was... Um, this, this kind of goes back, the, this idea of measure goes back to the reason, uh, the reason we started this podcast almost because our, our initial thing was that we want to think more about things that we think people should think more about. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. And things like how you, you, things like your relationships, how you communicate, social skills, humor, things like that. Yeah. These are all very high measure items. Yeah. If you could do something that would improve your social skills by even two, one or 2%, yeah. that would be game changing over the long period, over the long run. Ah. And normal people in inverted commas would find it weird, still find it weird when people read books about social skills or charisma or humor, be like, you know, uh, I once uh, downloaded this book on Kindle called The Comic Toolbox, How to Be Funny Even When You're Not. Yeah. And one of my friends, Jake, discovered, like, uh, it came up on my Goodreads. Oh, yeah. He, like, screenshotted it and sent it to, 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 like, our friendship, our friend's WhatsApp group. as like, haha, look what Ali's reading. Oh, uh, nice. Um, and, yeah, it's fine. That's fine. It's just banter. But I feel like the subtext behind that is that it's weird to read a book to try and actively improve your humor. Yeah. Which is, I think, just goes to show the bias that we have against against this sort of stuff because we just don't realize how just how, how high measure. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of the things that sort of you might be accused of overthinking and stuff, you're, you're accused of overthinking them because it's unconventional to invest in them. And I think with a lot of these things, it's unconventional to invest in them because they're high measure, but sort of low magnitude, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. Although it's pretty high magnitude when someone laughs at your joke, <laughs> that's pretty high magnitude. There's, there's actually that's one of the most high magnitude feelings in the world. I there, think. <laughs> there's nothing quite as nice as like making a joke at a dinner table and the whole table bursts out. Oh, it's wow. incredible. It's so so good, man. <laughs> anyway, how do we get to this? Uh, yeah. So humor, high measure. Humor is high measure for sure. Um, yeah. Any form of social skill, any form of voice, any form of physical health, mental health. These are all very high measure items. Yeah. Um, should we start wrapping this to a close? So we we've talked about your measure theory yeah Uh, do you want to quickly summarize summarize it and then i'll i'll talk a bit more sure so i think uh different events in our life sort of contribute different uh, value in different ways to us some of these events are like uh, let's call them high magnitude but low measure so this might be like having a really nice meal it's really really nice while it lasts you know you have this burst of pleasure or whatever uh but it's low measure once it's over it's it's sort of over and you're not getting more value out of it other things are very quite low magnitude but quite high measure things like Having a nice bin, for example, it's never going to make your day, but you use it a lot. And so it does contribute a lot of value to your life. And what we've, we've tried to do here is sort of think of other high measure things in our lives that might not be obvious to us that it's probably worth investing in. Um, so it, yeah. seems, it seems like the list right now is, I think, voice, speaking, mental health and sort of mental well-being. Uh, that's becoming more conventional now. Voice and speaking, I, I think, are still unconventional for normal people. No, social skills, humor. Yeah, social skills, humor. That pretty kind of much thing. anything that changes the way you interact with other people Yeah, uh, is going to be pretty high measure. So then just like in terms of wrapping this up on a on a more lighthearted note that might actually be actionable because I'm a big fan of actionable advice. Um, apart from the bin and the backpack, are there any other high measure physical items in your life that, 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 you've, that you value spending money on because of their measure? Because of their measure. Um, I think jeans are really important. Jeans are sort of a staple part of my outfit. I basically wear the same pair of jeans every single day. I don't wash them. I wear them, I'll wear them until they essentially fall apart. 
And so like I'm wearing these jeans for like you know, eight to 12 hours a day, every single day. Um, those are super, that's like super high measure. And so, uh, yeah, whenever I'm buying a new pair of jeans, I really don't yep. think too much about how much it costs. I, I think when it comes to clothes, there is a point after which you're, you're actually not paying for any, any extra value. Like if you're getting some brand or whatever. Uh, so I'm not really into that, but I think like investing in jeans and trainers as well. Like I wear those almost constantly. Which, which brand of jeans do you tend to go for? I don't know. It's not, I think it's called only and sons or something. It's, it's no particular brand, but like it just fits really nicely. So I think, yeah, yeah, for me, it's worth like having a pair of jeans that I really love. Cause like every day I put them on. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd agree with it that. It does make um, a difference. When I was in like, I think up, up until third year, I would buy Zara jeans from Zara for oh, okay. about 30 pounds. Yeah. And they'd always be, like, yeah, there'd be a pair of jeans. They'd be all right. But then in fourth year, I think I, I discovered All Saints jeans. Oh yeah. And they've got just the perfect amount of like elastication in them that uh, makes them feel really comfortable. And that, there, there was a period for about a week or so where we accidentally swapped jeans because we're similar sizes. Yeah. I wearing yours. And I was like, oh, these jeans are just not nice. And then when you gave me mine back, I was like, oh, thank God for these jeans. And that made me really appreciate that. Yes, every every 18 months, once my jeans fall apart because of the back pocket, it gets screwed. I'm gonna, I'm just going to spend another 80 or 90 pounds at All Saints. They can have my money. I don't even care to wait for the student discount deal to come on. It's such a high measure item. Yeah. I wear them for so long every single day. It really does not matter how much money I spend on a pair of jeans. Yeah, jeans are an amazing investment. Um, I've heard other people say things like high thread count bed sheets. <laughs> oh, interesting. It's like somewhere, or like, like um, merino wool wool socks oh hello uh supp supposedly stuff like this like according to those reddit threads that what's what, what's the most unconventional investment in your life that's actually provided lots of value yeah Th things like these are all also high measure so maybe people are just saying things that are high measure but without quite having the vocabulary for those yeah um i wonder if i can think of anything else i think another sort of high measure thing which isn't really a physical thing is just sort of your your workflows for different things that you do quite often. Oh, yes. Right? So in, in, in the, you know, if, if you work in tech, for example, if you do coding of any sort, there are like various tools that you use um, just to do your job. Like you write all this code and then you have to use these tools to, for example, collaborate with other people and things like that. Uh, and that's, that, that, that for me has always been something I've heavily underinvested in. Um, I never, I've never really tried to sit down and spend like a day just really getting to grips with my code editor, like learning all the keyboard shortcuts, all the things like that. And honestly, if I do, if I do do that at some point, to be honest, I should just do it tomorrow because it's so high measure. It'll make me I probably significantly more productive whenever I'm doing anything to do with coding. Another thing, if you're if you're in tech, is GitHub. Uh, this is sort of a, a tool that lets you collaborate with other people on on projects. Um, and so every time you have to like uh, upload a change that you've made to your project, you have to do it through this thing called GitHub and like l getting better at using GitHub and like learning all the commands and learning how to do uh, everything this thing can do. This would make a massive difference to your life. Um, I, I have heavily underinvested in this. And so every time I run into like an issue with GitHub, I have to like ask someone about it or Google it or whatever. And if I just like taking the time to spend a day or two really getting to grips with this, you know, three years ago or something, my life would be probably better. Yeah, I agree, hundred um, percent. I actually wrote a blog post on. I think this was like the second or third post on my blog in like twenty sixteen about how Alfred, this productivity app for the Mac, has changed my life because it just lets you, you know, press command and spacebar, and then you can type anything you want. You can search files. You can open apps. You can pretty much do anything. You can create custom custom workflows, custom shortcuts, and the the point I was trying to argue in this blog post is that every time I open a file. If it's, you know, if I can save even three seconds every time I do that, that is just going to yeah. add up to so much save time over my life. Yeah. That is absolutely worth doing. And people would be like, oh, why would you spend that seven ninety nine a month on this? On this? I'd be like, mate, do you know how much time I'm saving with this with this piece of software? It's like, yeah. it's, it's like, it's like 20 quid for the whole year's license or, or something like that. But yeah, I agree. In, investing and in workflow is just incredible. And like yeah. every time, if, if I learn a new shortcut in Final Cut Pro, my video editor, it's, it's going to save me time. Yeah. time and time is our only is our most valuable non non, -renew, non renewable resource. Yeah, so I think it's really valuable to like think about the workflows that you have in your sort of day to day life, uh, whether that might be in your job or some hobby you have on the side, or just like sort of your morning routine and things like that. The things that you you sort of do every day quite regularly. If you can improve those a little bit, then uh, it's going to add up to a lot of change over over the long period. Cool. So. That's it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. If you liked it, then please uh, leave us a review on iTunes. I think that's the only review platform for podcasts these days. Yes. Yes. Please do leave us a review. I on do iTunes. have one one more thing I'd oh, like to talk about. Sorry. I'd like to talk about your mini rant 
in the middle of this podcast about me railing against self-help. Where yeah. did that come from? I didn't really, I, I agree. I do sort of rail a bit against self-help in general. Yeah. Why? I haven't really been doing it during okay. this conversation. It kind of came out of nowhere. I, I haven't really seen you so impassioned. You were genuinely it's, it's you were genuinely triggered in that moment. It's because I felt personally attacked. By what? By your comment. Because when you were saying these things like, oh, well, you know, there's all these productivity advice. You know, like this one simple productivity hack. I didn't say it during this episode. I said no, that in response to your rant. No, no, no. But you said... It, it, did no, th- that's what you said first. And then I gave my rant about how it was unacceptable for you to not like cookbooks. Oh, and the reason okay. I was doing that is because I was thinking back to all my weekly email newsletters and how many, about maybe 25% of those are about, you know, simple productivity hacks. For example, um, when, you know, putting your phone across the room from you when you're going to bed. You would call it, yeah, that's a simple productivity hack. Yeah, yeah it yeah. changed my life. That's like, it's actually changed my life. Do, yeah, it might yeah. too, yeah. <laughs> Things like, you know, this rule I set for myself that I'm not allowed to watch TV on my own. I have to watch it with other people. That's, again, completely changed the game. It's allowed me to do so much more with my time. Okay. Time that would have been otherwise completely squandered. But why were you... Okay, fine, we and that it, counts in the category. You're right. You're right. I'm wrong. Yes. I'm the twat. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but I'm curious as to why you were so impassioned. Like, nothing gets you riled up. You are you're, you literally don't care about anything enough to get that emotional about it. I've... I in, don't see you like this very often. In fairness, I was feigning the emotion to an extent because oh, okay. I realized that I could, as soon as I realized the cookbook run, oh, okay. was, was you the thought, thing, oh, I was got like, I've got right. him on the ropes. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's kick him while he's down. <laughs> exactly. This guy. 100%. It's, yeah. it's, it's kind of like with David Mitchell, once, once he recognizes that he, oh, he's, he's got, got a rant coming up. Yeah, yeah, then yeah. He <laughs> full on goes to town on this rant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> so you're good. saying that <laughs> just because you haven't got a cookbook, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's because you haven't got a kitchen doesn't mean a cookbook is of any value. Uh, yeah. that's that's a really good impression thank you all right fair I'm working on it um hence, hence the rant i get it well played you thank got you. me wonderful w- one zero one zero we'll uh keep track of the score for the next episode so thank you for watching please leave us a review on itunes uh email us at hi at no overthinking.com if you want to chat we, re- we reply to everything we still reply to everything don't we yeah it might take it like a day or two sometimes <laughs> a day or two yeah but if, we, we if i reply. haven't replied to your email it's probably because i sort of saw it and then was hoping to reply but then forgot i will probably go through my emails at one point and reply to everyone so sorry about that if if that has happened yes all right so thank you very much for for listening we hope you have a fantastic week ahead and yeah bye next time bye